Good morning. Welcome to Relove Guitars. And without any preparation um, or forethought about this setup or whatever, I'm just straight into it. But anyway, that's fine. Um, back after a week away, uh, looking after my dad. And uh, yeah, what a, quite an education, I have to say. Um, I've not done that before, and uh, I'm no doubt I will do it again. <coughs> And uh, the best thing of all was uh, being able to give my stepmom the opportunity for a week off completely away from everything. Um, so there's nothing quite like that. And <clears throat> she sometimes would have time away, but it would be uh, it would be at the end of a phone, and uh, my dad would go into care in a different place which he didn't like because it was unfamiliar obviously um, and I think when you know when you've had a, a stroke or you're incapacitated and you have a, a in brain injuries and stuff it, it change can be very scary so um, every time he's gone away to respite care it's been very traumatic for him and then he tends to um, or has tended to uh, call her and bug her so she never really gets that time off anyway so the long and short of it is where's my toothbrush damn uh, the long and short of it is uh, I had a really interesting week learning just just taking care of somebody <coughs> and taking care of somebody else before me which is strangely enough uh, and those of you who have done it will know it's a it's actually a very positive experience. It makes you feel good about yourself. Kids, um, just in case you didn't, didn't know, but yeah, it does. It's a very, there's my toothbrush, I knew it was somewhere. Yeah, it's a very, it is a very positive experience and it's hard work and um, you know, obviously I could really get to just really see what my stepmom has to do all year round. It's a very, very hard job. Um, anyway, so we had a, we survived, and uh, I think he enjoyed me being there, looking after him, and uh, came back whenever it was, day before yesterday, and just sort of easing my way back into it. I needed a bit of a, <coughs> a day or so off. It's that tiring. So I'm back on the, the case. So here we are with Stevens SX, and uh, I think I videoed the first bit. But I'm pretty sure I would have done. I can't remember just the second. So ooh, I'll assume I did. Anyway, this this is a a little old, more budget, <coughs> excuse me, budget version of. The, the, the Taylor's baby, I suppose. I mean, it's a standard small size travel guitar, but it has a look and the tone of the Taylor. And in fact, this one, the model number inside, the, what's it, even calls it a baby. So it's an SX baby. <clears throat> so obviously Taylor can't even protect that name, bizarrely. Um, it's not even a, 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 you know, a trademarkable name. Anyone can call their guitar baby. So I just um, just wanted to lift a bit of the grime here. Um, it, it is quite old, this grime, so in some ways it may even be a better solution to scrape it off. But, um, to refresh it a bit. It could take a long time just by using tissue paper and uh, naphtha or Coleman's fluid so I might just lightly take the blade to it just to give it a, a bit of a refresh it's quite a, an efficient way of just taking the, the surface layer of grease off and um, what I want to do with this is to re-oil it anyway so this is just really a kind of hygiene thing more than anything. Anyway, so um, what did I do with this? Well, if you 
if I did record the, the previous parts then you'll know but if I didn't um, I'll recap uh, so what I did with it it came with a bridge that was lifted right almost half off and actually it was probably so far up that um, I would say it was probably only touching about 20-30% of its base on the top and the reason for this is that as far as I can see is that the the actual guitar top <coughs> being down here in a very wet climate has bellied up um, for what I've learned in recent times about humidity uh, is that that has a you know, it, um, too much humidity on a dry wood top like this will cause it to belly um, and the result of it bellying will lift the bridge off the deck um, it's very slow like a tree growing through concrete or something it has quite amazing power to separate the glue no matter how strong it is so it's uh, if you think about it you've got you've got a flat bridge on a not flat surface uh, and the two don't really want to match um, so over as it as it sort of bellies then uh, the thick the two separate so anyway <clears throat> what that's not in of itself a problem it, it's it take a long time before the whole thing flips off and snaps in your face but what happens is as the bridge rises as the belly rises and the bridge rises the action changes quite a lot and uh, becomes hard to play uh, and it also looks pretty bad so what I did with this it's a budget guitar I think it's you know, well under bought for well under the hundred pounds mark which is probably a, a, an average sort of price for it what I've done with this is I've taken the bridge off which is quite it's a fairly destructive process it's not easy to do and requires a combination of steam and force um, the steam or the warmth and the moisture just uh, just about softens the glue as much as you can soften it which isn't a lot I have to say um, but it, it gets usually just enough to get some blades like the chisel not chisels but you know, spatulas or whatever thin blades underneath the, the bridge uh, so you can add some leverage to that and eventually you can get it to come off um, it usually leaves a little bit of damage around the edge it's very difficult to prise it off without any damage at all so what I've done there's a little bit of scratching at the edge or chipping at the edge the bridge joins the rest of the body um, so what I've done is I've just uh, keyed up the, the whole of the top um, and then resprayed it with some uh, the word is escaping me at the moment acrylic is the word. <laughs> acrylic <sighs> lacquer um, which is matte lacquer and actually as you can see there's a really good quick job of going over the top it makes a quick um, nice fresh finish <coughs> uh, and it's going over going onto the guitar over poly which is a, a uh, an acceptable mixture of the two and, and I, I was trying to do research last week I don't know if for a newcomer to the guitar or relative any newcomer to the guitar world and finishing and stuff it, it, unless you come from industry where you handle this stuff all the time the maybe you might be like me and you might find that the whole thing about finishings guitar finish and lacquers is quite mysterious um, quite difficult to work out what is what so as, a, as a, an owner or a player you, you understand a little bit about there is nitrocellulose that you hear talked about which is one kind of lacquer or finish and then you hear about polyurethane which is another and then you hear other terms and that was hard to understand and you can't can get quite difficult to work out what's what and, and more importantly what you can put with what <coughs> and then obviously when you start going to research uh, you find there's a lot of kind of shrieked warnings about not mixing one thing with another um, this is plastic but I'm not sure I'm gonna replace it with a bone one I think 
I'm out. Oh, I've got one bone one. I mean it improve it will improve the guitar but is it gonna be the same size and it's a little bit longer but we could modify it. Anyway, um yeah so so it's really hard to work out what the uh what, what finish goes with what finish and, and you get really really paranoid about the whole thing. Um what I've managed to find out just the other week only is that um well, sorry, I, I, what I found out was a distinction that finally made a bit of sense to me. So, um, a question I always had was, can you successfully, and I'm not really even thinking about safely, but can you successfully use uh, nitro over poly? Because one of the things that I found that, that little nitro touch-up pots were really useful for finishing, um, you know, touching up repairs and so on. and. Uh, you know, was I committing the greatest of sins putting it over the top of a polyester finish, which most modern budget guitars are? And actually what I found out is that A, it's not a problem, and B, it's, it's actually quite common, and, and Fender and people like that used to do it a lot. Um, it was quite common, apparently, that they used to finish their headstocks. Um, they used to do the guitar body and headstock with uh, polyester sorry, polyurethane lacquer, <clears throat> and then they would uh, and they would put the decals on, and then they would finish the, uh, the whole thing on top of the decal with uh, nitro. Um, and, and somebody said that, that, or a commentary I read said that that's why some of their older guitars tend to have yellowing, yellower headstocks than um, the rest of the body. Um, I, I can't attest to that, I don't know, but it sounds a reasonable story. Anyway, so what we've got here is we've got the um, this guitar now. I have cleaned up the bridge as much as possible. It doesn't look brand new, it can't really. Um, there's a little kind of, there's a little light marking where it joins, the, the bridge rejoins. Um, you know, you can, you can, because it's a flat bridge going onto a a curved top, and the, by the way, the top is still curved. There's nothing we can do about that other than dehumidify it for years on end. But this is pretty well seated now on what is still a slightly curved top. So the, there's a mixture of the bridge being bent slightly to meet the bend of the top, or it's compromised between the two, a bit of clamping. Um, so it's a pretty solid join, but it's not perfect. So there is a little bit of lift, a tiny fraction of lift that you can see. It'll never be perfect. There's nothing. There's, you can't do it when this has happened to it. But my aim is to have reduced considerably the, the lift uplift of the bridge. And what I want to be able to do is basically to be able to put this back together. Uh, if I can get that's a that's a tricky one. If I can get this back together and get with my massive hands get the piezo widget back up through into the bridge saddle slot. But anyway, that's uh, some fun and games when I'm in the mood. So what I'm trying to do now, I think I may have to, I may well have to. Is it possible to do with this on? Or do you have to take these off? No, you could just... Can you do it with it on? Just about... No, you have to take it off. I feel it's, um, it's just a pain. You've got these things that you've got to locate by feel once you're in there. Okay, so there's my my unit. I'm going to plug that back in, and I'm going to have to fiddle about for a while to get them to re-plug in. And <clears throat> with gigantic hands, it's not at all easy. Now uh, the original, or it, well, as I got it, this unit had. Um, interesting it just became invisible as I looked at it and thought about it I picked it up it had a shim it's quite a high one it's about seven seven five of a millimeter so that shim is now out by virtue of the fact that I don't need I'm, I wouldn't want it anyway uh, I might need it again depending on how much reduction my gluing down of the bridge has resulted in um, but for now what I'm just going to do is attach <coughs> or reattach the the fluff, the shadow, uh, pick up the 
minute if I can find where the, where the screws are meant to be. Hello. See the top ones, can't see the bottom ones very well. Everything moving, not ideal. Mmm, nice sound from next door. Coughing. I'm going to use a power driver for this little bit because I don't want to be holding this, holding that, holding too many things in one go. So, back to some convenience here for a minute. Fiddly bit is I've not I've, I've not only got to find my way I've forgotten which way it went in now oh heavens <laughs> right, off camera I'm going to find my way to the plug-in bit that's the front edge this really is difficult can I actually do this so no I'm not even sure I can this is why it was hard to get out, but it seemed like I had to get it out with the... Damn, I, think, I, I don't think I can physically put these in from the inside, which means I have to bend them around. Not good. Well, not ideal anyway, let's put it that way. into a, a guitar that um, Stephen's daughter would like to play and that was my challenge sort of to myself really <coughs> and right up to until this point she hadn't really wanted to play it um, so I'm going to attempt to change that with what I've done to it and there's no way I can get in from the back of there to do this so this has to be done up before it goes in simple as that which means it has to be pushed quite harshly round the corner here with a bit of scraping. Okay, now while I'm at it, I don't know if this makes any sense to try and get this through here first or I'm still, no, I've got no access from that point anyway, I might as well just do that bit when I get to it. So in we go, now this is the, this is the bit that feels really hard, we've got to bend these wires round this Push that, right, there we go, push that into there like that. Kind of painful to do, but quite necessary. And then the rest is sort of fiddle fiddle. With tiny hands, which I don't have, conveniently. fiddly thing to attempt to do next. So I'm going to get my, uh, I'm going to get my file or a file of sorts here. Just want to double, give the piezo routing a little bit of a push. Let's see if we can clear it out. So <coughs> the piezo element is here. <coughs> Say boy, I say, I say boy, it's here. Right now, I have to move 
miraculously get it up through here. Oh boy. Yikes. Now, this is going to be so easy. I, I will find this really easy to do. Wires and stuff in the way. Holy. I can see the see the hole but can I can I get it anywhere near the angle it needs to get maybe oh, shoot. Shoot, shoot. I can feel I have enough grip on this blessed little thing really let's try again sorry this is really boring stuff you're looking at the back of a guitar with me Sweating and twirling like a an idiot. Where's the hole? Where's the hole? Get in the hole. Get in the hole, sunshine. Even just line up enough on the hole to go in. Damn it! Just a bit. Just, just, just enough to stay in the hole, would you? Into it, just make let's see what we've got any room going through. Right, there's your room. Ah, follow this, yikes, that's so painful. Follow this through. I'm basically trying to make as much of a space through here as is possible. <coughs> I've got it lined up. Can I get it through? Oh my god. do this by the way is to um, basically break this thing apart oh hang on we're through oh god this hurts oh my lordy ah, the only other way would have been to de, de take apart the wiring and try and get it through that way but as it happens I'm through Put this on and see where we where we get to with this. Now, using the original thingy, what I yet don't know quite is what the what the um, action will look like. So I can get a, a first idea by bringing up a, a straight edge. Make sure it's not in the way of anything. I just line up a straight edge on the various bits. Now, obviously that's way above the height on the first fret, but as a last fret action. That isn't bad at all. <clears throat> That's about two point something millimeters. And given that it's going to go down a little bit at this front part, uh, front part, the nut part, that's actually <coughs> that's actually very low action, and it might even end up being shimmed slightly. So first of all, I'm going to take off this jacket because <coughs> in here it is humid because it's Britain and westerly rains down in Africa are pouring in. Okay, so I'm happy with that as a start point. Um, we obviously have to do some cutting down here. Um, I mean, this. <coughs> I'm gonna not put a new saddle in this because uh, I'm not, I'm trying to keep the cost down. It's really taken a lot of work to get it to where it is, so I don't necessarily wanna increase the cost of it by shoving a 10 quid bone saddle on it. But I'm, just looking for now is a uh, here they are the original strings now they're absolutely filthy but they should do for just um well if I uh, I'm going to go off <laughs> go off line a minute while I just straighten that the ends of these strings so I stand some chance of using well yeah no actually I'm, it's not quite like a strat or anything I don't have to thread them anywhere just didn't want to get them all tangled up. But I think I still could be able to use them. So, yeah, the idea is I'll use these as a. I will. I will straighten them off off camera. But 
I will use these as sacrificial strings to set the nut slots and then to test the basic alignment and see if I need any shims. I'll be back in a sec. Okay, so we've got sacrificial strings on it. And uh, get ready. I will put the new ones on in a minute. We've got Earthwood by Ernie Hall, um, which has bronze alloy and extra lights. But um, <clears throat> you see, at the moment, this is holding fast, thankfully. Um, and that little mahogany tone, but obviously it's going to improve because these are oh, significantly grotty strings. So I'm going to work my way outwards. Uh, I also need a bit of a, a chunkier thing here. I need a 50, really. Well, actually, what I need is a 52, something like that, for this um, fella here. So I'm going to use. <coughs> I'm going to, in fact, I'm going to use. I'm going to go with the chunky side of the orange here. So this is just my sort of. My uh, replacement for. I need a 52, that's what I'm saying. Oh, hellfire. 87% uh, humidity here in good old West Country Britainishness, England. I'll put this to the m inches of thingy. Let's just see what the thing is. Uh, 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 53. That's 54. That's good. That's the sort of size of gap that I want for this malarkey. Um, okay, so my usual style, filthy strings, filthy hands, gonna take off these top two. <clears throat> this is a new, new bone nut that I put on myself, as you know, as you probably saw earlier on. So what I'm going to do right now is just take down these here. Uh, and it's 46, and, no, not 46, I'm going to use the 36 here for this one. And just going to widen the slot first of all with a little go with the 36 and then put that back in and then check how much clearance we got which is a fair bit now I could could be doing with my little bit of helpful string here which is, in this case is a bit too long but I don't want to cut it because I like having longer string than shorter but string is very handy when it comes to moving your uh, paracord I should say is very handy when it comes to moving your guitar strings out of the way without wrecking your fingernails which is usually what I do obviously has to move down the other end <coughs> or get completely away from the strings otherwise it's interfering and holding the string up um, so again this is the old patience model of work here and We just keep going until we get the required first fret action, which in this case is 0.4 of a millimeter. We go for the same 0.4 across all the strings, and I always choose a higher, a, a wider file than the actual gauge <coughs> gauge of strings I'm using because I want them first of all to fit, and I want them to have a little bit of room if you want to increase. My customer wants to increase the gauge of the strings he or she uses um, and uh, also because what I want is a free running string with no, no uh, catching and binding which is what costs you your tuning stability in my experience mainly it's, what, it's, it's at least a good it could be 50% of what or what causes tuning instability so my aim is to get this Smooth running and big enough, over slightly over the gauge. It's just about getting close to a bit of fresh air still, so we can keep going. So 0.4 is a is a conservative height. Um, if you ever want to experiment, and uh, this is getting a little deep now, so I'm going to deep man. Ah, <laughs> funny bone meets vice. Um, I, I'm just taking a my V file here. Um, when you go down in the slot, in a nut, in a bone nut, a certain amount, what you get is it, it starts to grip a little bit, no matter how well you've cut the slot. And that's because you know, you've got a certain depth of slot and you can never do it exactly straight. So you're, I'm cool with that. What was, to begin with, a nice slot, um, 
it's never perfectly straight, so it kind of starts to grip. It has a tendency to grip if you don't widen it a little bit. Hence, I use the V-file for that particular purpose. If you, um, whoa, whoa. was nothing bad but I think it was just the string pulling up at the base there um, if you want to know just how low at first fret action you can work with productively um, get yourself a capo stick the cap stick the cap on the first fret and measure the clearance on the following fret the new first fret once you've got the capo on and you'll see it's incredibly low because uh, uh, this is by the way assuming it will be low assuming that you don't have a six inch high saddle height um, when the action is pretty standard down the other end you'll, you'll see how remarkably low the first fret the new first fret action is whenever you use a capo and you don't necessarily always want to have it playing and feeling like that but it's just a good it's a sort of sober reminder that um, you can take you can take this action down to as little as uh, 0.1 of a millimeter and it will still play so you don't need as much as you think um, and with that in mind you can see that my target 0.4 is, is very conservative and I'm just uh, what I know is 0.4 or between 3 and 4 I usually go for about 3 on electric guitars but between 3 and 4 0.3 and 0.4 four of a mil at the first fret um, gives you a very light low light first fret action um, which feels great to play <coughs> and not only does it feel great to play but if we do this right we make sure that the tuning is stable by virtue of the way we cut and ensure the slots are wide enough to do the job so we get low light action and we get tuning stability and we by having this low first fret action we also get rid of uh, a nasty little problem that you get when the, the uh, nut slots aren't low enough and the first fret action is too high and it's perfect uh, and what you get is a intonation problem on your on notes fretted down at this end which actually shows up most on an acoustic guitar when you're playing open chords so bad that it makes you want to take the guitar back and or sell it and change it for another one. So big gap here. So I'm gonna take this off now. For this one I could use I could use a variety of things. Um, I could use this file here I could I'm gonna use the this one here that I've picked. This is a bass guitar nut file. It's a bit crude because it gives you a more of a square bottom to the slot which it'll do it works um, but it's not it's not the most perfect shape so you could round it out if you want to with something that you have like this which is close to but you don't want to you don't want to over overdo it otherwise you, you you're in danger of creating a, a catch <clears throat> somewhere where it catches on the, on the way down a lead ledge excuse me so I'm, I'm sort of just switching between the two um, to get to where I want to get to. I'm trying to keep the angle of the cut mostly consistent at <clears throat> between anywhere between 5 and 10 degrees. Um, and I, I'm just using the, the smaller file, which is quite a lot smaller, but I'm just using this to try and round out the bottom of the slot a little bit to make sure it isn't too flat. Keep tuning it to, to pitch. Um, the reason for that is I want it to be closely as close to pitch as possible, just to make sure the strings sit fully down in the nut. If you don't get it to pitch, if you just do it with very lightly or slack strings, what happens is, or can happen, is that the uh, the string can sort of sit halfway up the slot, fooling you into thinking you haven't got down to the required playing action on the first fret <coughs> and you can carry on cutting away at it um, and with the result that 
when you do put it under tension it pulls straight down into the bottom of the slot and you're suddenly uh, your string is basically then sitting flat on the first fret and you've got nowhere to go other than to attempt to repair uh, that particular slot which is completely possible to do but you don't want to start out with that if you can help it so this has still got a fair way to go that it would be simpler if I was using just a, a, a 56 file for this which I don't actually have so hence hence my combination of things to get down but I'm just I'm doing basically the same technique I'm just aiming to get down to the action I want using the carefully using the variety of variety of tools I've got available we're not far off actually a little bit of an air gap <clears throat> once I've done these three bass strings I will switch to the top three and then we'll be pretty much done and ready to um, restring with some nice new very close to the mark that will do me okay so we go to what's probably now going to be the simpler of the three which is the top three okay so slack off the, <coughs> the top two as you can see are filthy so they don't feel nice to handle but then we go at it with our 26 use our string to pull it off out the way and away we go we can support the nut more than anything at this point so anything anything these these files one of the downsides that they have is they're very thin obviously to do the right get the right slot gauge but because they're thin they bend and because they bend then they, they end up not going fully straight through uh, the slot which means that they can end up with uh, being a little bit tight even though they look straight they can actually have so much curvature in them or enough curvature in them to send them sort of grabbing the string so what I'm doing is I'm doing a kind of mixture of the slot file the nut file um, and widening it a little bit with the jeweler's file because um, actually and if you get my ebook you'll see how I do this but you can do the whole lot just pretty much with the jeweler's file um, and it's in a way because of its rigidity and the sharpness of its tip it, it has some real advantages over using these expensive and slightly spindly files which you know, they were all very good um, on paper, but actually in practice can can end up with creating, creating almost more problems than you want. Anyway, another way to go around it is if your files get to a certain age, you can either start using further down, but if your headstock doesn't allow it, which it will on this kind of guitar, but it won't on a Strat style guitar, um, you can always break these things in half which seems like crazy but if you've worn down these far ends then you might as well and you get yourself a sort of a fresh end unused part uh, which, which means you can actually use that quite effectively on, uh, on a Gibson style or acoustic style headstock like this and or a Strat style <coughs> just on the mark stop there Stop while the going's good. So a combination of the two things can just be just a little tricky to get exactly right. But okay, so now we're on the point one seven. And these these are sort of slightly easier to pull out of the way by hand, so I'm not using the, the string as much. Um, but again, now we're in a place where the where the the file is so thin, the slot is so narrow and the file is slightly bent twisted already that what you get is snagging pretty quickly so my recommendation and that's the case is to proceed with caution with your what's it file, your jeweler's file 
get closer to the mark, and this is what my ebook shows. Um, get close to the mark, and then just go and finish off with your uh, nut file for the last bit. And really, what you're doing in that case is you're just rounding out the bottom of the slot to the sort of correct profile. But this, one of the benefits of using the jeweler's file, by the way, is because it's V-shaped, it sort of does the widening for you all the way. So you don't have to worry about the catching or sticking in the slot because most of that is taken care of by the, the very fact that it's a, a V, not a trench, not a straight wall trench, which is what you get with this. So, I mean, you can obviously, if you're prepared to, once you've, if you can cut the trench using this kind of file, then if you're prepared to go over your whole nut with a file, you can, of course, cut off the excess until the strings sit proud, but you've just got a little cup. Um, it's quite hard to do that with utter precision, so I would, I would suggest that you probably don't aim for that, um, but it is possible. And I sometimes do it, but you, you, there are some ways you have to kind of, kind of fill the slot with some pencil or pen or something, ink or something to mark so you can see where, if and when the uh, leveling process has gone down and hit the bottom of the slot, because you don't want that to happen. Um, I think I've said in older videos, but years ago, when I didn't know much about this, and you'd go on for, I'd go on forums for her, and you'd, you'd, you'd hear people discussing how a nut should be or look or whatever, and. Um, there seemed to be a, an obsession with mainly the way the look the nut looked with its string sitting proudly on the on the top. You know, it was it was really important to have them sort of just barely balanced in a little depression, so all the strings sat proud at the top of the nut, um, which is great if you can do it and get the correct first fret actions. But it seemed to be at the expense of any correct first fret. Action. Now I'm just praying, I don't pray, I'm hoping that this will just hold out, this dirty old string will hold out until the point where I've got this slot cut and oh, it's going to want to go that way off the side which is a little bit stressful for the string. Go on, off you go. I'm going to just make the first marks here with this V file. Continue it with a V5. It's hard to see, it's obviously it's a white material and it's it doesn't it doesn't give you a lot of in the way of information term, in terms of shadows. Um, so then take the file to it. This is I'm using a 13 instead of instead of a 10. So it will cut very quickly and very directly into the, the nut. And we have to be careful we don't suddenly come too far. Well, it's not playing because the string's on it. Still plenty of room. So there's a few things you've got to be careful of when you're doing this. Oh, lift it up. So a little bit more. It's getting close to its ideal playing action anyway. And once we've done this then I will I think I'm just going to basically oil the fingerboard and uh, restring. And then, then the thing I'm going to do a bit, oh, a bit later on is do a sound test between or back to back, head to head. Is that the word? Yeah, somewhere. Shoot off between the two guitars, my Taylor Baby and this little SX thingy. A bit more. Yeah, I'd be interested to see who, which is which. Oh, somebody coming through the field. 
see, see if um, who likes which and which sounds better than the other and so on. Um, uh, obviously, having <coughs> owning one, the tailor, and that's good. I'm I'm done on this. Owning one and enjoying the sound of it, and knowing knowing both and how they work, um, how they sound. Uh, I I my immediate prediction. I think it's going to be uh, a tight challenge actually, because I think they're. They're both, I think they're similar enough to, to present some problems or to, you know, for, that, for them to be possibly indistinguishable. Now I won't, I won't say that as far as the electrics go, but beautifully out of tune, but I'm going to dump these strings right now. Push this out of the way back a bit, so, okay, goodbye sacrificial string. We are... We are now, the nut is set to the right height. I think the action by default now is good on the, on the last fret. Um, it could possibly go down a smidgen, but I, I want to try it out in a minute with new springs on. And if it feels good, I'm going to leave it. I'm not going to do anything more to it. I'm not going to take the action down any further. It's going backwards, that's why. Sorry. Um, yeah, it's going to oil the board and go from there. Now, this is caught up, which is really annoying. I was just going to cut this. Try and cut this. Lift all these up with my puller, my fret puller. But it's a way of getting them up and out without putting any pressure onto the bridge itself. There we go. Goodbye, filthy strings. You have done your service. They look and feel horrible. So Stephen, I hope your daughter enjoys the feel of these new strings. But first, a little bit of oil for as a finger ball. Have we got any left in there? Yeah, we got just enough. As I said, once you've taken a, a bridge off, it's my experience is it's kind of almost almost impossible to get it back on without any signs. It's a bit like the the fingerboard issue, you know, some, when I before I'd done it, you know, I would I would read uh, you know, tales of people saying, oh well, I took the fingerboard off this guitar and replaced the truss rod and blah blah blah, and um, it all sounds very good and easy, and you, you kind of have an idea that you could just take your guitar along to a luthier and say, do me a favour, mate, change the truss rod on that for me, and you'd kind of expect it to be, oh, I don't know, twenty-five quid job or something, and uh, in fact, when you do it you realise just what a massively destructive job it is. And in fact, you really would be almost better off, in most cases, just buying a new neck and replacing it. And the reason why is it involves a lot more than you at first imagine. Um, and, and, it, and it has a, has a direct link to the, the business of um, taking the bridge off a guitar like this. So the fingerboard is glued to the underlying uh, in this case mahogany or on um, many guitars maple um, and like like the bridge on this guitar you can maybe if you're lucky soften the glue a little bit but when all said and done it doesn't want to just fall off <coughs> um, you have to pretty much chisel it off and that chiseling process without a doubt uh, is destructive so it will cost you some parts some surface, some edging, you know, where the, where the bridge joins the edge of the the, uh, the top, and so on. So it's it's very difficult. 
Um, also, if you think about it, once you're, if, if you are, and once you are hacking off uh, a fingerboard, uh, or you know, let's stick to fingerboard, if you're hacking off a fingerboard, um, you're breaking the join between the fingerboard and the, the underlying neck, obviously, but that also breaks an original lacquer seal um, where they, the two have been glued together in the past and then lacquered over. So if you break it, you now have a, even if you could fit it perfectly, which by the way you cannot, uh, even if you put them together in exactly the same position, you would uh, you would find you've got a, a join that you can feel, and that if you want to get rid of it, you have to re-lacquer. But of course you can't just re-lacquer that tiny thin edge, you have to re-lacquer the whole thing, because otherwise if you don't, you'll have... Um, you just have a blob of lacquer, you know, which you'll be able to feel. You won't be able to blend it in. So you're kind of pretty much obliged to re-lacquer the whole neck in order to disguise or lacquer over that new joint that you've just made. And these aren't sitting all the way down, but they're far enough. Um, so, you know, you've, you've chiseled it off. You've not got a, a very clean break. You have to decide whether you flatten these off, both sides, the underside and the of the fingerboard or the top side but the other thing that happens when you steam off or heat off the, um, the fingerboard as you're doing it just as you want the heat to loosen off the glue so you can get the fingerboard off it also causes your frets to want to fall out and also your inlays usually so quite frankly you are almost to get it to work again you're pretty much rebuilding your neck um, it's, it's like I said, it's a, it's a horrendous amount of work and it's just economically it doesn't make sense unless it's a, a guitar with a huge sentimental value or it's a you know, vintage guitar that you've got to save and you're prepared to put the money into it and you know, it, it, honestly it's not, it's not even the field I would claim to be uh, you know, good at or specialist or expert in. You know, my, my thing, as you know, is setting up guitars so they play great. Um, if you've got a 1958 Gibson that you've got to take the neck apart and pull the truss rod out of and replace it with another one, then uh, I would happily recommend lots of different people to take it to. It's not a job that I would want to do. Um, but it's just, I think it's just important or interesting to, to point out that when some people think of doing it or asking me how much, you know, could I do it on a budget guitar? Could I, what's their option? What are their options on a budget guitar? And it, I've done it um, on a few guitars and sold them afterwards. But the truth is I've, I've made a huge loss in time. In, in energy. I mean, I did it just for the experience, um, but I didn't make any money on the time it took to do this because uh, it, it's just it, it isn't it does not make economic sense as the old business person might say. So yeah, don't consider it. And these days, you know, if you've got a a guitar budget guitar that, that a bolt, particularly if it's a bolt-on neck but um, certainly if it's a bolt-on neck a budget guitar where the truss rod doesn't work and you think you've you know, pulling the fingerboard off and replacing it um, I'd say look for another neck and see what the options are for replacing that neck it's probably going to be much easier and more satisfying because you like I say you, you're never going to get it back to where it was I mean, it'll be better in some ways and different, but it won't be the same neck, let's put it that way. You know, by the time you've re-glued or even made new inserts to fit back in, those those tend to fit okay because they sit in, you can get them to sit in a little bit of glue. But if it's a square on a less pull neck, like a trapeze, trapezoid thing, um, you know, that's, that's going to sit in there with a lot of empty space and look a bit manky. Uh, that's even if it hasn't warped out of shape. And that's the other thing, by the way. So you take a fingerboard off, and a fingerboard is not meant to exist on its own, free of its substrate, which is the strong straight neck. So a fingerboard on its own is tends to bend and warp. 
um, particularly because it's punctuated by loads of fret slots and with the frets shoved into it. So, um, yeah, it's not a happy thing on its own. So you don't want to do it. That's what I'm trying to say to you. And, and please don't be, please don't be surprised if someone like me says, "Oh, well, I'll do it," but it'll cost you. Um, well, four or five hours of work, you know, and you're, you're into the price I would charge, you're into 150 quid territory or something like that, and it's just, it's not really worth it economically. Okay, so now I have a whole set of new strings on this little thing, this little, literally, little baby. And uh, let's just have a quick look how it looks right now. It's looking nice. It still has a few little dings on the side here and stuff, so it's not a new guitar by any means. But my aim is to make it. Actually, it's, my aim is to make Stephen's daughter want to play the darn thing. So I'm just going to make sure these strings all come up and sit comfortably. Probably a bit more, more um, a bit looser than I originally wanted down the bottom there. The reason these pins aren't sitting oh, as far down as they originally would have done is because um, in, in plugging the holes and stuff I've made them a little bit less straight through as they were originally. So they've got a little bit thicker, narrower, that's the word, as a result of the work on the bridge. Um, but it's kind of impossible to do that, what with filling the bridge, uh, you know, flattening the surface of the top masking, filling the holes so that they didn't get covered in glue and so on. So it's a bit of a compromise. Okay, so let's take a look. that's sitting firmly on the top. We have guitars out tune but sounding nice. Um, just obviously going to carefully do some more stretching. I say carefully because when you buy a specific set of um, strings for a guitar, there's nothing worse than overstretching like I do sometimes busting on the strings so you just don't want to do that. Action-wise and restored bridge-wise, fingers crossed that that's as strong as it looks. Um, you can only know by a bit of time. Um, that's sounding pretty. So I'm going to hang this up and let it settle strings-wise, tuning-wise. Right. 
it doesn't. I'm going to hang it up and play it a little bit. Um, but what I'm then going to do is do a back-to-back. -back. So there we go. That's Stephen's SS SS SX. So it's custom guitar, but it's um, it's a SX Baby Stroke E, which is the electroacoustic model. Um, done. Ready to go home. All I've got next now for Stephen is the Variax, which has to. Uh, has a whole setup to do, but importantly, has to have its battery compartment re redone. Uh, it looks like it had been left in a damp place, same as that, but left in a damp environment for far too long. And not only had this broken, uh, this part here had broken, snapped off. This is a new one, obviously, but also the battery cage had uh, corroded. So I've got a new battery cage and a new unit, which I'm going to obviously solder into place. And we'll start again, um, and we'll see if the thing. While it's in tune, you've got to hear it. For that. You've got to hear it. allowed to use that you've got a pre uh, a preamble no you've, you've been pre-warned but you can't use that to judge which of the two is which in the blind test promise me you won't do that see you in a minute hey anyway, so here we were our am um, and having just done a little sound sample test we tested these two or did a back-to-back -back of these two cute guitars and what we have here is the uh, on my left hand my left hand we have the Taylor baby uh, mahogany and in my right hand I have the SX baby mahogany thing um, and they are very very similar in all kinds of ways you know similar look uh, matte finish um, this one has a, an ebony fingerboard this one has a rosewood fingerboard um, but in many ways they're kind of they bear a lot of similarities this one has a conventional guitar a guitar acoustic neck body attachment where you see it sticking out there this one uses the inner fixing with the two screws and built into the fingerboard. I really like this that lump of red thing is there. Mm. Anyway, I really like the construction of this. Um, some people find having some screws in the fingerboard really offensive and stuff, but I think it's a, a nice thing. I just did a back-to-back uh, -back sound test, so I'm not going to give it away by um, playing these next to each other. <coughs> Otherwise that would spoil the fun of it all. Um, but if you look down at these two things, um, they do have, they share a lot in common and obviously one is a, I don't know the new price or what these retail that new, but they're obviously kind of, you know, they're relatives or they're meant to be the same sort of travel guitar. The SX is borrowed heavily from the styling, um, but there's not a lot you can do that obviously to make them different if you're making a small the dreadnought style travel guitar. Um, the, this one here has a bit of patterning. Actually, it's a, it's a bit naughty because it tries to copy the Taylor pattern. This is embossed into the wood. This is printed on the wood by the looks of it. Um, but, you know, for a little carry around guitar, um, this one, by the way, has a quite a quite a bold back. I think this one's a little bit flatter. Yeah, it is. So there's a definite difference in the 
no, you won't be able to see it very well, but perhaps if you can see it from the side there, the uh, the SX has got a flat back, more or less, whereas there's a distinct bowl on the um, the tailor. Both guitars uh, have a little bit of um, bellying going on <coughs> because of the climate here in the southwest of the UK. So if you put a flat line across, a rule across here, you will see that it's it's higher in the middle, as it is this one. Um, this one, the bridge has never come up far enough to cause me any problems. It's it maybe, maybe will do in time, I'm sure. This one, um, obviously, I've just taken the bridge off because it was tilted up at an angle and there was fresh air underneath, so I stuck it back down. So we've got a, a nice playing action there once again. <clears throat> I mean, uh, I will play a couple of notes side by side because it's quite interesting to, to see if there's any noticeable difference. sustain. They both, both of these guitars, I mean, all of these little guitars that I've ever come across, have, um, I'm not sure what, what note it is, but if you sing notes, sound like an idiot, they sing back at you, obviously they resonate, I can't remember which note, I think it's probably around the E. You can make this one sing. Yeah, they really, they really are um, responsive. Now this one has brand new strings on today. <clears throat> this has slightly older strings. I can't really do two guitars at once, can I? But. So you um, can have a listen on the back-to-back the -back sound test and see if you can tell the two apart and I'm just playing one song all the way through. This one has, um, what happens with these, these uh, what do call them, uh, matte or silk finishes, they shine up with use so uh, you typically find a lot of areas where your hand hits, there's a bit from where your chest hits it, shall we say, and then there's a bit where your, your hands hit it, so it always gets shiny. Um, with <coughs> with the one I've just uh, redone the bridge on this one, um, I was able to just spray all around there. To give it a bit of a um, matte finish again. It's a, it's a little bit shinier where I piled on the lacquer a little bit thicker because I wanted to fill in some kind of marks there but anyway um, so this is this is a nice comparison the two of them they're, they're not as you know this one isn't as pretty the SX and the construction this one has a this one has a sort of a, a, I don't know I can't I don't know what the correct name <coughs> for this joint is but it's got a single piece of wood all the way through to there and then it's got a kind of diagonal joint that um, the back part of the headstock fits on which which is kind of good in a way because that makes that stronger this one has a distinct and very unique or very individual style. You can see it here. It's a it's a very precisely machined joint for the for the headstock to go into the the end of the neck. And I, and the, the the grain on this is much prettier, long kind of stripes of grain than on this one. Um, but on mine, on the tailor, uh, because of the bowl on the back, of course, <coughs> it puts it into con connect into contact with your body a lot more and particularly on you know if it's an outdoor summer's day guitar this gets a lot of sweat and kind of direct contact with your skin so you can see that this could probably do with a bit of um, a bit of a re-lacquer from my tin of lacquer it wouldn't hurt at all actually just give it that matte lacquer respray um, possibly would fill in this this area here where I think um, it's just suffering from a bit of rub off of the lacquer but <coughs> you may find that even lacquering this might not fill in that colour because I think some of the original colour has gone, possibly gone with it, or it might just be the scuffed lacquer making that colour. And this one has the the, ro the rosewood, the mahogany. No, ah, uh, ebony. Anyway, let you be the judge of which one's which on the other sound test. I've got this one fitted with a LR bags system, which I don't use that often actually, but it is pretty, 
pretty sounding when uh, when I do use it. It's got a battery velcroed into place there. So just a quick look between the two of them. Um, not really a pro, pro anything, as they say, but um, I would I'd be happy to, to to have both in my little stable. I think the tailor is prettier. Obviously, it's got a slight more variation in tone. It's got a bit more extreme. Um, but th this SX is a really nice copy, um, and they're both you know, the same size. The same size, and they they both sound pretty pretty good. Um, personally, I prefer the sound of mine, but that's maybe because I'm used to it more than the other one. Um, but you might, in the sound sample, you might be struggling to tell the difference between the two. There you go, just for interest.